You are listening to the cycling podcast at the Tour de France in association with Rafa, celebrating the sport and producing the finest cycling clothing since 2004. Today we are in Troyes. Hello, my name is Richard Moore. I'm with Francois Thomaso. Hello. And Lionel Burney. Hello, Richard. We've uh, survived 24 hours without Francois, haven't we, Lionel? Just about? Just about. The dynamic, the, the three-legged stool that we've become had one of its legs missing last night because Francois was seconded to go and play on loan for ASO today, um, doing the live coverage for the Latour.fr website in both English and French. So if you were reading that today, you were reading Francois's words yeah, covering my, my apologies <laughs> to which, everyone <laughs> well it meant francois you missed uh, a quite extraordinary eccentric hotel well b&b really in a in a ramshackle rundown chateau in lure which is um, not the nicest of towns we had a a, a pretty bad experience there in 2012 didn't we richard and it mm -hmm. wasn't a lot better last night i last time we were there i dubbed it an economic downturn theme park um, because everything is closed down or boarded up or showing. I mean, there's just not a lot of money in that area. I'm not being unkind or disrespectful to the place, but um, it, it's the sort of town, one of those towns that France seems to have forgotten a little bit. And our chateau has tremendous potential. If anyone wants to uh, go and have a look at it, you take it, it on. It would make a great Channel 4 series, wouldn't it? It would, yeah, to, um, renovating the chateau. Mm. Maybe we could do that, the three of us. Well, yeah, lots of those. I mean, uh, last time we were in a... I was staying in a place called Villers Sexel, and there was a castle as well. And we and the, actually the ho the horse was the the baron or the count or whatever he was, and he had all this gallery of portraits of his family, and it was pretty strange. And he, he told me I was sleeping in the house in the bedroom of his mother. I don't know what you know if it was an honor or something, but uh, no, very strange uh, area. But, but you should be happy because you know what I had for dinner last night without you guys? Go on. I stopped on the motorway between Lure and Troyes and I had a pasta box. Oh. <laughs> we did Never eat pasta in France, Francois. No, we yeah. did a little a golden bit. Golden rule. I, I, we went to that Moroccan restaurant that we've been to where the last time we were in Lure and mm. the food was no better now than it was then. But we've gone from... Well, the fact that we're talking so long about oh. this is, is indicative of, of what happened in the stage, really, isn't it? Well, Tonight, now we're in Troyes, we're in, we're in Cham Champagne country, mm -hmm. yes, really and, and yeah. we are in a, I don't know, a renovated... What is it? Mill? Yes, it's an old mill. You yeah. thought it might be a hospital? Well, first when we came in, it's like a brick factory and uh, with a big chimney. And my, my impression was I, I knew same, the same kind of place in Lille. And it was actually a hospital and a chimney was where they burnt uh, the dead, you know. So I, I thought, well, very welcoming place. But <laughs> I, I'm probably wrong. It's now... Well, we, we've got a, actually this river mm. running down in front of us, and it's, it's obviously a mill, an old mill. It's yeah. it's quite, yeah, I mean, they, these are, it's a kind of an apartment hotel that we're in tonight on the outskirts of Troyes. Pretty um, nice, though. But it has a kind of disused factory, um, you know, s Air aspect about it. to it. Yeah, the, 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 the factory over there, all the windows, windows are broken and, yeah. and what have you. Um, maybe it's supposed to be, maybe it's a sort of the, the French Banksy is the architect, I don't know. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, mean, I told it's very trendy, you know, to rehabilitate this kind of old factories, decayed factories. You put uh, cinemas in there, sometimes you have artists, there, there is one in my place in Marseille, you have, you have these... Uh, you know, contemporary artists p painting the bricks in various colors, and you've got punk bands rehearsing and stuff. Uh, and, and sometimes you have an apartment hotel, so why not? You know? Yes, yeah, it's, it's appropriate, isn't it? We're behind, beside this gushing water, just 24 hours, a hours after our, <laughs> our, our our water feature <laughs> in, in last night's podcast. Our seemed to be award-winning water which feature, which got a great response. People seem did seem to enjoy. It. One one person, I think, it was on Instagram, said that they were on the edge of their seat uh, listening to whether you were able to correctly identify the waters. Some of my friends Francois. were at the edge of their seats as well because they only see me drink, drink wine, so they were very surprised that I had a secret life <laughs> in, in, involved in water. But there you are. Well, hang on, chaps. This is supposed to be the cycling podcast at the Tour de France, so mm -hmm. we, we ought to talk about the cycling tell, a little can bit. Can you give us a tell the time, but can you keep it brief, please? That won't be difficult, Richard. It was stage six from Vesoul to Troyes, the home of Andouillette, and depending on 
who you listen to. It's either one of France's finest delicacies or it's a disgusting sausage made out of pig's intestines. We we shall find out later. I imagine it will be on the menu later on. Um, The stage was 216 kilometres across the empty French countryside, really, and very warm it was today. When you think uh, how chilly and cool and damp it was in Dusseldorf, it's now really warm, really feels like the Tour de France, but it was not a... You know, in terms of sporting entertainment, it was not a rip-snorting stage, was it? Three riders went in the breakaway. They were Perig Kemeneur of Direct Energy, Frederick Backert of our new friends, Wanty Group Goubert. If you have a chance to listen to this morning's Kilometre Zero, it focuses on their breakaway um, riders. And the third rider in that group was Vigard Starker Langen of the UAE Team Emirates. They were only really allowed around four and a bit minutes lead. At one point, Laurent Pichon of Fortuneo tried to go across the gap, but he made very little headway and eventually gave up. The trio were caught with 13 kilometres to go. And then there was the sprint finish, and Marcel Kittel won again after his victory in Liège. The jerseys remain on the same shoulders that they were on this morning, so Chris Froome is still in yellow, Arnaud Demar is in green, Fabio Aru in the polka dots, and Simon Yates in white. But the sprint really all about Marcel Kittel and that late move because at one stage and our photographer Simon Gill captured a great shot of Demar and Andre Greipel, you know, neck and neck on the near side of the road to where Simon was standing. And Kittel really goes round in a big arch, doesn't he? Takes a very long way round, comes from deep and uh, finished it off with, with power, really. Well, Lionel, you were um, at the finish line. You spoke to Jack Bauer from Quick Step, whose job was a little bit earlier than, than the sprint, but he, big, powerful rider, um, came very close to a stage win, didn't he, at the Tour de France a couple of years ago when riding for Garmin. You spoke to him, an interesting insight into the sprint finishes generally. Here's Jack Bauer. Obviously worked out perfectly for the team, but can you talk me through the crucial f- final few kilometres? I didn't see inside of three kilometres, actually, so I probably can't give you much of an insight. But um, inside of five, we we moved up with the majority of the team on the right-hand side. There's obviously a hard 90-degree corner at uh, 5K to go. Um, and from there, I just put my nose into the wind and <laughs> I think lasted till 3K to go. So what happened in the finale, I'm not too sure, but he obviously managed to, to deliver. Well, can you describe like what your tactics are supposed to be in these sprint finishes? Because we're we're not seeing sort of multiple teams all lining up in trains yeah. four across the road. It's all it's slightly different. I can't quite get a handle on what's going on. I think most of the sprints in the tour so far, positioning has been key from 40, 30 k out. So everybody is really already working hard and knocking elbows and bumping shoulders from let's say 30 k out. That's the case today, at least. So I think a lot of teams are using up a lot of guys and gas early on. And when it comes to these, these finales like we've seen today, like we've seen the day that uh, DeMar won, there are so many roundabouts and corners inside the last couple of kilometres that it's, it's very, very hard to keep everybody gelled together and to form, like you say, a so high-speed standard lead-out. We always come in with that plan, but, I mean, I haven't seen footage of today, but... It hasn't really worked out the last two times. So it's kind of a law of diminishing returns in a way. If you get everyone all together, that's fine. But it's maybe if you're all all in a line, it's not as easy to keep the speed high through those corners and roundabouts. The speed is high, but it's very, very hard to keep position. And it's a little bit of an insurance policy to start using guys from 5K out like we did today. It obviously must have uh, worked to some extent (laughs) because he got through the last 3K uh, unscathed and managed to take the win. Yeah, but no, no two sprints are the same. You just have to adapt to the circumstances. Yeah, yeah and as Marcel has showed, I think you probably saw the first sprint stage. It was pretty versatile that day. He came alone. He came from a long way back, and he picked his line and his timing impeccably to slingshot from behind and, and take the win at you know quite some speed. So I think he's he's a pretty adaptable sprinter. He's very confident uh, in the tour this year, which is great to see, and it brings the whole level of the team and the spirits of the teammates up as well to give him. 100%. The interesting thing there, Rich, was obviously I asked him, oh, what, you know, how did the sprint play out? And you kind of forget that these guys who are doing the early part, they've no idea. Of course, <laughs> because he said radios haven't been working very well either. I, I talked to Arnaud Demar, I can tell you he saw it. I mean, he said, well, it, it, it was a funny one, as you say, because a little bit like in the Sagan incident, yeah, there were the, the sprint of, with two parts. In, on the one hand, we had the gripe against Demar. Everybody was looking at that, and all of a sudden, oh, 
another another guy uh, surges and, and wins it and Demar said I was into my battle with Greipel and suddenly on my left I saw he said I saw a blue a, a blue wing fly past <laughs> that was Gitton I thought the, yeah, the image was pretty good yeah that is good it, it was um, I, some potentially dangerous manoeuvres by Arnold de Mar. I mean, we saw the other day Cavendish obviously come to grief uh, trying to squeeze through a, a, a gap that, that Peter Sagan then made even smaller. De Mar today uh, went for a similar size gap by Lutz. It's just the the nature of sprinting, isn't it? Kind of, well, I was about to say elbow, he kind of elbowed his way out of it, but no, he doesn't use his elbows. He kind of uh, uh, weaved his way a, a, around the... Um, around Greipel, I think maybe it was, maybe also Greipel is, is a far, far less dangerous um, sprinter than Peter Sagan can be, and maybe he's, he's much more, I could I say, urban or polite. And when he saw that there was danger there, he, he didn't try. He could have Greipel could have gone a little bit towards the, the right, and then we would have had a crash again. So it was a very fierce battle, but a gentleman, gentlemanly one probably. And while and, and Demar also said the same. He said. I was so into that battle with Greipel, I was looking for my line, and I forgot that there was a sprint, And uh, but that, that's one thing that Kittel didn't forget. I mean, Kittel was about 15th with about 300 metres to go. He came from a long, long way back. And, you know, as Jack Bauer said, we're not seeing conventional lead-outs. We, we, very, very odd move by Edvald Bosenhagen as well, who did have a bit of a lead-out, but dropped him off too early, and he decided to just sort of almost try what Lucas Postelberger did so well at stage one of the Giro to, to sort of clip off the front to catch people slightly unawares didn't quite work out for him No, you mentioned Andre Greipel uh, Francois and he'd been ill um, a few weeks before the tour uh, I spoke to Mark Sargent at the finish he's the, the boss of Lotto Sudal and he was really pleased that Greipel was in there in the mix um, and, and feels that he's coming better as the days go on and with you know plenty more sprint opportunities and also of course Peter Sagan and Mark Cavendish not being here the, the sprinters field is narrowed down a little bit um, we wrote uh, Greipel off didn't we okay, at least a couple of years ago at least a couple of years ago calling him a fading force but he still has that power you know, under the hood, and you're absolutely right about the. You know, remember, was it last year or the year before? He could have blocked Mark Cavendish mm. off when Cavendish won one of his sprints, mm. and he didn't. He made the conscious decision to leave the door open for someone who was coming past rather than uh, put fellow riders at risk. And um, you know, that's uh, yeah. that's his style. Yeah. And today he was looking really good. And if the finish line had been a little bit closer. Uh, he may well have uh, may well have won, but Kittel was just you know on a different level today, wasn't he? He was. There's a little stat there uh, here that is now that you know, uh, Greipel was on 11 wins on the tour, and now the tour Germans are on level on this, with the same number of wins because it was Kittel's 11th uh, stage win on the tour today. There was um, I was going to say I had a flashback to the HCC High Road days with Tony Martin on the front for Katusha. They were another team that tried the the lead out for. Christoph didn't quite work out. Another man who was in there uh, leading out his sprinter, Jacopo Guarnieri, he got tangled up a little bit with Nasser Buhani. It, I tried to watch it afterwards. It wasn't really clear. They were pretty close to each other. He's Arno De Mar's lead out man, of course. Uh, and he was pretty angry at, beyond the finish line. Buhani is an idiot, he said on TV. He didn't just pass me. He also put his knee into my bars. He's a dick. He's always making people crash. We know he's like that. He's probably upset with us because he always loses. There's been a bit of a continuation of that feud on Twitter. Buhani's come out fighting and Guarnieri has tried to sort of calm it down a little bit. But yeah, that's par for the course, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, uh, as we said, you know, we are discussing before uh, we, we started the, the, the show tonight. Um, these guys are sprinters. Uh, you know, they, they have, they're, they're hot tempered uh, on the bike. They're hot tempered off the bike. And it's part of the it's part of the battle. It's part of the excitement. I, you know, it's it's nice in a way to see the battle take place on the road and, and to see it, you know, kind of uh, go on to, on on Twitter or other, or other social network. And and usually it comes down. And Garnier is a very very nice guy. I, I mean, I I talked to him you know many times. He, he's he's what he's really the lead out man for Arnaud Demar, and he's, he's normally quite soft spoken. So I suppose that. There must have been a problem there. Buani has got a bad reputation. He's not he's exactly the <laughs> the opposite of Garnieri. So I, I don't know. I didn't see the incident, so I don't want to talk about it too much. But uh, yeah, I think it's part of the game of of sprint these days. 
Can I just add a little, a little something? Because we always for, forget these guys in the lead out. The, the lead out is the last stretch uh, of the sprint. It's in the last K, more or less. But during the day, there was a long, long day in the sun. And you have three guys, uh, Thiago Machado for Katusha, last back for Lotus Sudal, and Julien Vermont for Quick Step, who spent the whole day leading the peloton in the sun. And I, I hats off to these guys because their, their, their role is, n is never, you know, uh, publicized or or praised and 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 it really they really spent a long long hard day yeah they're doing the same work of the breakaway but without any of the you know the plaudits or the glory or the exposure really hi i'm kristen i'm a ride leader in the rafa clubhouse in amsterdam and you are listening to the cycling podcast in association with rafa the rafa cycling club is the largest global community of its kind members share their passion for the road through rides events exclusive club kit and racing. Find out more at rafa.cc. Thank you very much to Rafa for sponsoring the cycling podcast. A reminder that our clothing, our Rafa produced clothing is available. And some of you have been posting pictures of yourself wearing your Rafa clothing, uh, cycling podcast clothing on social media, where there's a Pedal de Charme t-shirt, Pedal de Charme jersey, and uh, there's a cap as well. And uh, that's that is a limited range. Initially, if if uh, demand proves high, uh, we will expand it and add women's uh, clothing as well. We sincerely hope. Um, so yeah, hope you hope you enjoy it. You'll find that at rafa.cc. Also, by clicking on the shop on the cyclingpodcast.com. Speaking of the Pedal de Charme t-shirts, we will be awarding one of those this weekend to the first winner of the Pedal de Charme competition of this year's Tour de France. The poll was launched a couple of hours ago and uh, racing into the lead is Taylor Finney with 60% of the votes so far, a popular choice. We've also got Johan Fredo, Guillaume van Kiersbroek and Teish Banot. So the four of those, Teish Banot was actually nominated for apparently stopping after the climb up to La Planche de Belfi, I think, and giving a, a young, a very young fan a bottle. That was nice of him. So that that's the sort of thing that earns you a nomination for Peddler de Charme. Um, and uh, he, well, Van Keer's book is second at the moment. Ofredo and Benut are lagging behind, but still another 21 hours as I speak to vote for your Peddler de Charme. Uh, we're running the poll on Twitter. So make your make your choices. But Finney, it's Finney's to lose at the moment. I hope I hope it fits him okay because we've only got a size small with us having having learned our lesson last year bringing some mediums and realizing that professional bike riders are pretty much all size small and he's a very tall lad well, he's isn't a big he? unit he but is. it should be fine anyway well we shall see it's up to the public you know the the, the people will speak and we shall listen the will of the people shall so, decide um, what were you saying during the the, the break there Lionel because well, it was, was really really quite eloquently put makes a change doesn't it yeah, um <laughs> probably won't be able to say it again <laughs> that's why i noticed it oh that's well how nice of you francois it, the bullying was supposed to stop when francois <laughs> returned to the team richard um well what i was uh, in the past 24 hours the the, the peter sagana story has has blown one way and then the other um uh, bora hansgrower put a, an appeal to the court of arbitration for sport to try and get the uh, expulsion from the Tour de France turned over. I, I can't quite see what they were thinking about that one because that would be almost unprecedented. I haven't looked back at the whole history of the Tour de France, but I believe riders were um, in the very early days of the race. If they didn't finish one stage, they could start the next, but they just didn't count for the general classification. But in the modern era of the Tour de France, a rider being reinstated after you know a couple of stages have been run, that would be absolutely extraordinary. Um, the appeal to Cass was very short-lived because um, within a few hours of the, I, I assume the case being made to the Court of Arbitration for Sport, they said there was no case to answer, and they they upheld the decision to kick uh, Sagan out of the Tour de France. I spoke to Bora Hansgrohe's Pachi Villa. Um, after the stage, just to get his reaction to the fact that their appeal had been unsuccessful. Well, I mean, if we if we appeal to the to the to the cast, it's because we thought that uh, there was uh, the, the right thing to do. I mean, you have to use the legal tools you have on your hand, and the next step was just to to appeal to the to the cast, and that's what what the team did. And of course, if we do that, it's because we thought uh, the initial decision was wrong. But yeah, with no intention. I mean, just to because it's next step. Has your team spoken to anyone from Dimension Data? Are relations still good? I don't know if somebody did. I didn't. Uh, but uh, we are friends, and uh, Rolf and, and Matt are, are friends, and 
I mean, we work together. I don't see that I work just with my team. I work with uh, with all teams of, of that are in the race. So uh, probably it was not the moment yesterday. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm sure that uh, we'll we'll drink a beer together. But guys, that story's blown up one way and then blown down the other way, and and we're witnessing, a, I think, a sort of trend here. Francois, you were talking yesterday about. Uh, you know, how people say things in the heat of the moment after a stage, then the media report those words. And then before you know it, you know, social media have fanned the flames and everything's burning very intensely uh, for a few hours. And then people calm down a little bit and then come the retractions and the apologies and the, uh, the, the you know, everything dampens down a little bit. And the news cycle is kind of affecting the way people are thinking, I think. And there's this, it, with these incidents in the sprints, and the, the precedent's been set by the Peter Sagan um, decision. And so with Damar looking a little bit, uh, you know, iffy today, you're absolutely right, Richard. It's not as eloquent, is it? But <laughs> with with, uh, with Demar looking a little bit iffy today, the first thing people are saying on social media is, "Well, what about that? Are they going to kick Demar out for, um, you know, any kind of dodgy moves?" Um, and so we have this kind of real uh, intensity of debate for a very short period of time, and then everyone kind of calms down a bit. And and uh, it's not like the old days where something maybe would make a a bigger splash for a a longer period of time in the following day's newspapers and maybe rumble on um, but perhaps you know we wouldn't see these stories concluding quite so quickly yeah Vox Populi is is all right it's nice and the social networks have given it kind of a you know a a prime I mean it's it's not it's now almost you know as if Vox Populi is more important than 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 you know thinking you know a little bit of backward view on things and uh, um, so it's it's all very fine that the people will express themselves, but in in in, in the end, uh, as we saw with the second case and we saw today, uh, you know, y- y- you need probably to have wise guys, and in, in this case, the ju- the jury, the commissar of the juries, or you know, experts, wh- whoever they are, to try and, and and you know, calm down the situation. In the old days, uh, well, they're, they're in bars and, and all over France and in pubs around football games, they're the same thing as we find on twi- Twitter today these days happened you know there was on as you say in front of tv uh, you know in in, in at, at home uh, it was very simple to 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 but now th- these days th- th- all these comments don't stay within the bar or within the home or within they're, they're, they're all over the, the 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 internet and that's what it's it's nice because we we all share things even our in excitement and even our angers and even now uh, but you know from time to time we, we shouldn't take this too seriously, I guess, and you know, in in in, in the long term, the thing that matters is probably uh, maybe it's a piece of, of advice I should apply to myself. Only look at the Twitter, uh, you know, reactions to to anything the day after. But the problem is that these things do um, stick around, and 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 can. It's very difficult to erase. You can delete a tweet, but someone will screen grab it, and you can't really erase that social media history, that footprint that you leave, and. You know, there's some well-publicized cases of, you know, when it's backfired horribly. There's a whole book, you know, by John Ronson about um, so you've been publicly shamed about people who have tweeted or posted something on social media that, you know, that they shouldn't have done. That's offensive or emotional or and and it's it's really it can destroy lives, can lose people their jobs. But in the case of the FDJ rider Jacopo Guarnieri and his comments, and he's then he's kind of retracted those and calmed down. He on said those. that on TV, of course. Yeah, he said that on TV, and then you know probably by the time he's got back to the bus and he's had time to think about it and and and, and calm down, it's not necessarily the comments that are the problem. He's perfectly entitled to express a comment in the heat of the moment, where say what he really thinks. It's the it's the ex- the reaction against that and the fact that um, it, you know every comment you know it becomes a controversial comment and what we don't really want is we don't want these guys to all just stop saying stuff because they're worried about the reaction and you know getting sort of trodden on by um by social media or 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 being embarrassed by their comments um and so we we need to kind of have somehow have a an atmosphere where you know people can express themselves freely even if what they say is uh, slightly inflammatory or you know near the edge um or unpopular Without have the, the sort of swarm of, of backlash, because you know, he's he's entitled to, okay, maybe not be offensive about Buhani, but he's entitled to say so what he thinks d- of Buhani. Started the Giro as well with Dumoulin, you know, um, criticizing Quintana and Nibali, and almost being forced to backtrack a little bit immediately because there was such a, 
you know, an, a, such outrage, such an overreaction to what he'd said. And that, that's a pity because somebody like him, he's a very honest, sort of open person and you don't want him to close up. Yes, that's what I'm saying. I don't think the, the, the Twitter uh, postings or Facebook postings or, or Instagram postings should be taken as official, you know, uh, written uh, in stone uh, statements. They should be taken for what they are, you know, uh, kind of... Uh, uh, you know, immediate reactions or uh, bouts of excitement and, and, and no more. Talking about uh, taking one day to reflect upon things, uh, this morning I talked to a team director for BMC, but I can't name it. I can't name the guy because he said, well, I'm telling you this uh, because you're a friend and, uh, and I'm not telling the journalist. And he, he, because I asked him to about, uh, you know, BMC's tactics yesterday in the stage, which, uh, as you know, uh, you know, created a little bit of a controversy again. Nobody really understood what it was trying to do. And uh, so I said, what, what did you do? I mean, well, what were you trying to do? And he said, ah, well, he told me something that, which I can't repeat personally. And so I tried different questions to, to, to you know, to, to come to a point, uh, you know, which I could convey to you, and I, the last question I, I, I put on the record was, uh, f finally, don't you think there are far too many team directors at BMC? And he just answered, you, you mean far too many? That's, he said there are more than this, you know, so, <laughs> and, he, and, he, and he laughed, at, and he really laughed. So apparently, it seems that there is a little bit of struggle of power within BMC with, diff with conflicting points of view, conflicting tactics, and the result is what we saw, is that uh, apparently it was never, uh, you know, on, on the briefing in the bus, it was never decided to, to have the um, BMC riders lead all day. Uh, it, was, it was made on the race, and obviously, uh, you know, team directors were not uh, in agreement uh, about all this. And I'm not saying there is tension at the moment within the team. But from what I gathered from uh, what this guy told me, uh, well, at least there are a couple of disagreements. I think they better settle down and talk about it and sit down in a hotel. Uh, otherwise, maybe Rich's uh, chances might be a little bit hampered. Just on that, very quickly, um, obviously, you know, people were castigating BMC for that tactic and you know if it had worked out slightly differently they would have been hailed as, as geniuses well done you put Sky under pressure you delivered it in the end um, at the end of the day whether it was right or wrong will be borne out not on the stage to La Planche de Belfi but over the, the coming two weeks and also you know they are entitled to ride in any way they want to ride my kind of point against that is why give Team Sky an easy day Chris Froome said in the press conference this evening how grateful his teammates were that they didn't have to do anything yesterday on the first big day to La Planche de Belfi. It just, it, that's what doesn't make sense to me. Why do so many other teams seek to sort of step in and fill that gap that team, when Team Sky aren't maybe at the front? And, and Team Sky must have been rubbing their hands together all the way towards the climb. Um, and if somebody else wants to do Team Sky's work for them in the coming mountain stages, well, you know, they need to sort of think about their tactics a little bit more, I think. Did you see what happened today? Even today, which was a very relaxed stage for, uh, you know, GC leaders, uh, they, they came a stage, uh, it, about two-thirds of the stage of the day, when, when the chase actually was came close to bring back... The, the the SKPs a little bit too early, and actually it's the, it, from what I saw. I mean, I was not in the bunch, but it's Team Sky riders who told the, the sprinters teams, "Could you please slow down a little bit? We don't want to catch them too early." So, so my, my impression since just just at the beginning of the tour that Team Sky were maybe a little bit, maybe not as strong or as commanding as, as in previous years. But when you see a couple of Team Sky guys come to the front, talk to the sprinters teams, and say, "Could you please slow down?" and they do. Well, uh, I mean, <laughs> that's a lesson, you know, <laughs> who's leading the show, you know? The Cycling Podcast is supported by Science in Sport. Science in Sport, fueled by science. Thank you very much indeed to Science and Sport for sponsoring the Cycling Podcast. A reminder that all our listeners can get 20% off all their Science and Sport products at scienceandsport.com. Uh, if you enter the code CPOD20 at the checkout, CPOD20 at scienceandsport.com. Now, we're in, we're in Troyes, and Troyes is a place we were chatting today, Lionel, with a rich British cycling heritage. A lot of 
British riders have been based here over many years? Uh, that we know of, that we could remember, Malcolm Elliott being one in the 80s, what rode as an amateur here. Um, Russell Downing was here for a while. Simeon Hempsall. Simeon Hempsall, yeah, former national amateur road race champion. Dan Lloyd was here for a few months before um, he turned professional. More recently, Adam Yates. Adam Yates, of course, and Simon Yates on the podium here in the white jersey. Adam Yates rode here for UVCA Trois. Now, there's a couple of big clubs here, isn't there, I think? And uh, so I'm not going to get it wrong by saying who rode for which club, but I do know Adam yeah. Yates rode Most for... Most famous is the one where, where you had the, all the Simon brothers, and mm. four or five of them, they all, all won stages of either in Tour de France or Giro. So, yeah, that was Pascal Simon, who, of course, led the 1983 Tour de France until he crashed and broke his uh, shoulder blade, and uh, that paved the way for Laurent Fignon's first win, and then uh, Jérôme Simon. Jérôme Simon, yeah, I think it was Jérôme Simon who won a stage. François Simon held the yellow jersey. I think it was Jérôme. No, François Simon won a stage. Régis Simon also won a stage. I think there's one of them. Jérôme Simon probably never won a stage. I think Jérôme Simon won in Tour de France the Giro. I think. I'm testing me there, 1988. <laughs> um, the, Francois Simon, of course, held the yellow jersey yeah. in, I think, 2001 One, and still right. had it uh, on that's the stage right. to out Duez when Lance Armstrong did the look to Jan Ulrich. Going, I think it was that yeah, day. Going but further back, Derek Harrison, way ah. back. Uh, and I was I was here in Troyes 10 years ago to, well, I interviewed Pascal Simon, also interviewed Jack Andre, who is the local big wheel in the cycling world in Tuan. He runs a club and, and has, has nurtured a lot of British riders. Ironically, he doesn't speak any English, but he's helped over many years bring British riders. His view is that they are hungrier than a lot of the French riders because they've made the effort to come here. Adam Yates is the one he's most recently helped, actually. Um, but I was here because Robert Miller was also here. Um, Robert Miller rode here, but actually Robert Miller didn't ride for one of the amateur clubs here. He rode for ACBB. But he settled here later, met a local girl, got married. Um, and my book about Robert Miller came out after that visit here in 2007. A bit of news about Robert Miller, um, which is, has come out today. Robert Miller is now Philippa York, having transitioned a few years ago and been living as Philippa York for a few years, has decided to come out fully and will appear, I believe, on ITV during their Tour de France coverage, has been writing as Robert Miller for publications like Ruler and Cycling News. And she has written a statement on Cycling News, just announcing herself as Philippa York. I think that's a great step forward for her, personally. I know she's she's been around about cycling events over the last few years, but has has kept that identity private. Um, and uh, as I say, there's a statement from Philippa York on uh, Cycling News, if anybody wants to read the full statement. It's quite, quite a thing. And uh, best of luck to Philippa York. Yeah, I mean, in cycling circles, that's been fairly well known for a number of years. And, you know, it's good that uh, Philippa has been able to make that announcement at the time of her choosing. And so, yeah, absolutely. Good luck. Um, but th sticking with the theme of Trois here, you, Richard, spoke to Rod Ellingworth, who's another um, British cyclist who spent his amateur career or some of his am amateur career here. Obviously, didn't become a... a, a, a professional rider in you know the, the sort of the, the the world tour sense of of the word um but now working as race coach for team sky we were talking to dan lloyd as, as well earlier about how he came to Trois, and it's like a lot of these things uh you know when one rider from say britain or australia uh, comes to a club and does well then the, the question goes out well you know who else can we get to come over and uh it was rod ellingworth who got dan lloyd a place over here and kind of set him on the road to uh, becoming a road rider because he'd been doing a lot of mountain biking up to that point but uh, what did rod have to say about his time in Trois? shall we hear from him here he is rod ellingworth well, when did you come here uh, mid nineties or something, yeah. What brought yeah. you here? David Miller sort of put me in contact with the the people here in the town, and they, you know, so I ended up with them, you know. So, yeah, I loved it actually. I mean, you know, just coming in all along the roads, and you know, just remembered the all the roads. I mean, I, I haven't been around the roads for twenty odd years, you know. Uh, you know, I had a good time here. I'm going to go meet the family who I used to sort of be friends with later on tonight, you? and yeah, yeah. It's, and Adam Yates, I think, was here. Any other recent ones here? Uh, yeah, so so I, you know, help, you know, was part of that getting in contact with Adam down here. And recently, Jeremy Hunt's brother. Can't think recently. No, I don't think anybody's been recently. I don't think the club is. I don't think either club is running like they used to do now. I think. I think the last sort of ten years, something gets back. It's got less, I think. So, but yeah, no, I had some good times here. Actually, really enjoyed it. Yeah. 
Because there was, uh, you know, all these British writers living in, in France, it, it's all very well, and, uh, you know, and the Entente Cordiale has always been something very dear to my heart as an Anglophile, but we, <laughs> we today, I mean, the peloton rode past like, the Croix de Lorraine, the Lorraine Cross, which is the, the symbol of uh, French resistance and General de Gaulle. Uh, there was a sprint, intermediate sprint today in Colombie les deux églises which is the place where General de Gaulle was living. And uh, actually, um, in 1960, the peloton already rode uh, through Colombie les deux églises and that day, uh, de Gaulle, who was the French president at the time, was, was kind of on holiday at home in, in July, and he just stepped out of his house and to, to watch the tour. And uh, it was unannounced, but when Jacques Godet, the then director of the tour, saw the general uh, on the side of the road, we decided to halt the, the, the peloton, and they stopped to shake hands with uh, Charles de Gaulle. Gastonin and Cini, who was leading the race, you know, uh, shook hands with uh, de Gaulle. So did Henri Anglade and a few, a few other riders who were there. And the story goes that a, 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 poor, a poor, well, a reasonably unheralded French rider called Pierre Buffeuille actually had been dropped by the peloton, and thanks to the halt to, to say hi to the, to, the, to the general, he managed to make it back into the bunch. And actually, he, he attacked <laughs> just after <laughs> Colombier de Zeglis and went on to win the stage. So it was, it was quite a moment for Pierre Buffeuille. Thanks to the general, he managed to win uh, Tour de France stage, which he probably would never have won otherwise. <laughs> I think that's a great note to end tonight's <laughs> podcast on. Let's go and eat Andouillette. Oh, no, let's not. Of course we will. <laughs> I will for sure, and we'll t- well we'll tell you about it. We'll tomorrow. tell you all about it tomorrow. In the meantime, <laughs> thank you, Lionel. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Francois. Thanks, Richard.